as a um, general introduction, uh, this is a webinar for especially for people from publishing organizations and we like to update and inform you about the activities that from the part of the International STM Association we've undertaken in the area of research data. Uh, we had a long-standing collaboration with the World Data Systems and we were doing some projects together and over a year ago we merged and morphed them into the broader activities of the Research Data Alliance which is an international uh, initiative stretching really the whole world and many many countries uh, and most of all many different stakeholders. And within the Research Data Alliance, we've set up a group on data publishing in which we have representatives of data centers, of research institutes, of funders, and also, of course, of publishers. Within that uh, data publishing group, we're now ready to start four initiatives. And in today's webinar, uh, you'll be updated on, um, on each of these. And, uh, in the following order, we'll have a first a broader introduction on what our group does by Michael Diepenbroek of uh, the World Data Systems and of the Pangea Center in Germany. Then we have Sunja Dalmaya Thiessen from CERN in Geneva, the High Energy Physics Institute in Europe, as most of you will know it. And she will be talking about a project where we try to uh, design and develop more generic workflows for the publishing of data sets and publications. Then we have Hilke Kors of Elsevier and uh, he will be uh, giving us some insight in the work that his group is doing on publication services, publishing services, and that has to do with a linking infrastructure between research data and publications. Then our fourth speaker is Sarah Callaghan of STFC in the UK and uh, Sarah is leading the working group on bibliometrics and our fifth speaker of today is Ingrid Dillo of the Dutch data center uh, DOMS, the research data center of the Netherlands and uh, she will be talking about cost modeling and especially cost recovery for data publishing. So that's quite an ambitious program. Uh, we have short talks so that leaves a bit more room uh, for, uh, for questions and discussions. Um, in our rehearsal we found out that people with low bandwidth uh, will see the slides appear very slowly. So uh, remain patient. Sometimes the story you will hear is not completely synchronized to the slides that you will see, but uh, uh, we'll try to keep it going uh, as, as good as possible. Um, so uh, let's give it a go and Michael, maybe let me see now, do I have to make you a presenter or can you just start your slides like this? Well, I can try to do this, but um, if it does not work, um, we should okay. just a moment. Okay. Here we go. So my bandwidth is not very high, so I can see that you cannot see anything, but I start uh, talking anyhow. So uh, the introduction is about uh, archiving publication of research data, which we think is a serious gap in scholarly communication. And, we can see um, your slides, Michael. You can see the slides. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Um, but I see here, you know, in, in the uh, webinar uh, window that uh, not all of them can see it already now. Okay. Um, so uh, this is here um, study tracing back to 2010 by the Publishing Research Consortium. Um, they have tried uh, to find out uh, which types of uh, scientific information are accessible and how and how important uh, they are. So requesting uh, near to uh, 4,000 uh, researchers. And uh, not surprising, uh, it came out that research articles are very important 
uh, but are also uh, accessible in a very good way. Whereas data are also seen uh, to be very important, but are not accessible. Um, well, uh, the accessibility is rather poor. So data are important, but they're hard to find. Um, and even worse, <laughs> usage of data needs even more. So uh, what is clear to scientists all over the world is that by now their data need to be persistent and, uh, and citable. We need licenses. Uh, we need uh, quality assurance on data. We need to have review procedures, um, so comparable to uh, the review of articles, but uh, sure, the semantics need to be different. And uh, what uh, is the point that I personally think is, is very important is efficient usage of the data. That is, we need to have data, metadata, and interoperability standards in order that the data are uh, machine readable. Um, to um, visualize this, you can see on the right side now a picture. At least some of you can already see it. Um, so that is the situation currently going on that it was most of the data repositories worldwide that uh, the data are archived, but they are archived as submitted. So the data are not harmonized. They're not processed. Uh, there's no QA, QC on the data. Uh, which leads to, to a situation where we can uh, simply say that they, uh, this does not meet uh, the scientific objectives um, uh, worldwide. You know, the, is, uh, the, the movement is towards large scale and more complex applications in science. So actually what we need is uh, to have something that is more consistent. So consistent storage of data needs processing and harmonization of data. And uh, this is uh, something that we need to stress. And that is something what we call fitness of use. OK, this is already uh, has been part of the OECD principles and guidelines for access to research data. So traces back some seven years ago. Next slide uh, sketches um, the the status of research data, um, the long tail of data versus um, the short tail of the data. So we have, um, I can see that nobody can see this one. <laughs> OK, it's showing up. So the, the slide here shows um, is a diagram, the fitness of use versus the total volume of data. And as you can see, on the left side, uh, there is a slot with professionally managed and published data. A uh, large part of the data are uh, coming from large-scale monitoring or computed data, so modeling data, or from disciplinary data centers, um, as uh, data from the WMO, for example, or remote sensing uh, and climate research, you know, all these data. Uh, uh, are accessible in a quite well manner. Uh, then there comes a slot of unmanaged open access data. These data address actually uh, those data which are accessible but are not usable in a way that is necessary for the science uh, of uh, today. And then we have a very big slot of unmanaged and non-public data. So these are the data from individual scientists, labs, or smaller projects which are not accessible at all and not reusable um, also. So um, that's what we are addressing in the WDS RDA data publishing interest group. And we have uh, set up a number of working groups here that uh, Evke was describing. So publishing workflows, services, bibliometrics, which are address, uh, actually addressing the incentives necessary and cost compensation. So this, these are the groups that are collaborating. So they, they are complementary, more or less. And they are, um, the, the, the goal is to, uh, to improve the situation of the availability and usability of research data. 
And in particular, and that's why we have you as an audience uh, here, um, we want to foster the collaboration between data archives and science journals. And that means practically that we do want to link editorial workflows. We want to uh, set up linking services, so linking science articles and data sets. Uh, this is the main objective, uh, at least from your perspective. The stakeholders that we have compiled uh, in the WDS RDA Data Publishing Group comprises uh, representatives from research facilities, data repositories, universities, libraries, and um, in the end, um, last but not least, also from the publishing industry. As you can see here on the right side, now I see that <laughs> not many of you can see that. Uh, possibly because of the logo circus. Uh, so many of the uh, publishers are, are part of this consortium uh, and also many of the data centers and uh, very um, also on a high level uh, organizations like RDA or the ICSU where data center uh, system dance ends and so on are present here. So that's what I have to say here and uh, I think now we can step into the first um, working group uh, led by Hilke and Adrian Burton from ENS. So uh, yes, Michael, yeah. uh, that is to say we were going to do Sunya's presentation first on workflows. Oh, sorry. So That's guess, okay. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't matter. Sunya, are you ready for it? Yes, if you pass me the presentation, right? Um, yes, Michael, can you Make senior yes, presenter, I'm I'm oh. doing it right now. Okay, perfect. Yep. Okay. So. Because um, we experience from the researcher side, there is lots of policy pressure to share data. However, we of researchers don't share data. This is obviously um, happening for various reasons. But we think um, one of the main reasons is that they're actually not aware of suitable workflows, trusted workflows that would work um, within their disciplines and that actually create an incentive for them to participate in data sharing and data publishing. So um, we believe that for researchers and for this um, people working with researchers, so all the other stakeholders I already named in the beginning, it is crucial to have information about workflows and to understand the options they have at hand because often there is not only one option, of course, because there are many opportunities, for example, just a simple choice of the data repository. So that's um, why um, my colleagues I joined later came up with the idea to um, study workflows and to test um, workflows, and I will come to this later um, in more detail, and to enable a more um, yeah, theoretical and hands-on study of what is happening right now and what might be able in the future. This should um, not only allow efficient and reliable reuse of research data now and in the future, but also enhance the possibilities of greater discoverability. Um, I would like to underline that this um, working group works across disciplines, um, not only like I work in high energy physics, obviously, um, or um, in the health sciences but, or the geosciences, but also should go um, across disciplines up down to um, the humanities and social sciences. This is um, in parts already reflected, and now I'm on the next slide for the working group members in the list of um, yeah, working group members where you see that we have already lots of partners um, from the publishing sector, um, research institutions, um, libraries, um, I work for library for example, um, etc. Um, also different um, disciplines are present. Uh, however, um, we lack um, humanities and social science, for example, and we are definitely looking for more input. So what, are we, um, what do we want to do in more practical terms? We want to look at the individual workflows for publishing data right now. 
um, and thus pave the way for the future um, data publishing, the workflows, obviously. Um, this in-depth analysis um, is based on the um, on existing workflows, for example, that we have um, at CERN or um, the one from the UK Data Archive is another example we have already done. And uh, we want to establish standards, so um, meaning generic components of these workflows. Um, for example, um, how does um, someone deposit a data set? How does um, data peer review work? Um, how does, um, or is there a workflow for um, metadata check? Is this done automatically? Is this done um, a, hand, a hands-on approach? Things like this. So this is a very rather theoretical um, starting point, which um, we are in right now. Then the second part of, the, um, of this um, exercise is about the real implementations. Because as part of the first um, exercise, we will see um, and we already see that, that there are lots of gaps, meaning that there are researchers who have no access um, to workflows to publish data, and I mean formalized workflows, not um, just putting it up on a website. Um, and uh, we would like um, to understand in this first phase who has the workflows, but also who has no workflows in place. And then in the second phase, we would like to target um, and um, engage with um, the um, stakeholders and researchers who don't have workflows and then try and use these generic workflow components um, that we um, found in the first um, phase and um, test them in a live environment. So um, that we have, um, yeah, for example, a peer data peer review um, component, uh, maybe in much more detail even, um, which could be reused um, within a given, for example, journal environment or um, yeah, peer review environment, particular disciplines. We are interested in who does what and what kind of responsibilities are associated to this, which might be, for example, interesting if um, a journal decides um, to establish a dedicated data reviewer, for example, because we are aware that this, this exists in some disciplines, for example. Um, also of interest are, of course, automated versus manual processes. Um, I'm just imagining um, out of the box a workflow where um, an, an author identifier is used to connect a data <coughs> with a data set submission, for example. Um, the second part, as mentioned before, um, of the work program is about the live implementation. And that's where we actually need you as the publishers, journal editors, um, etc. on board, because we would like to um, use, um, establish these generic components and describe them in enough detail, um, even maybe, um, you know, use, uh, reuse um, code um, if, this, uh, if this is a technical um, implementation, and um, try and um, go to the um, people, journals, publishers interested, uh, and um, ask them if they have you know, want to use it and test it. Um, since we have um, done the more detailed work already um, description, it should be easy to implement this and um, we are quite looking forward to see how this would work. Um, but, yeah, in particular across um, disciplinary um, differences. So where are we now? Um, we are right in the middle. Um, well, actually, <laughs> maybe that's um, to um, understand what's out there. Meanwhile, we are collecting and or decategorizing workflow examples that we are aware of. And um, one of the reasons why um, we are here is um, because we are very much interested in your experience in this, meaning if you have data publishing workflow. prepared um, already. Um, we're, because we are interested in really the details to allow others to reuse this. Um, current categories we look at, um, and that's the basis for this questionnaire I just mentioned, are for example um, standardizations, um, or peer review for example of the different of metadata, of data, of technical checks, etc. What kind of uh, standard format, that's for example very interesting for me because we have suffering from a lack of standards um, in high energy physics. Um, 
the number of people involved, as said before, the, what kind of responsibilities exist. Um, I'm personally very interested in uh, persistent identifiers, DOIs, ORCIDs, um, all these um, things that matter now um, in, um, I think, trusted um, data publishing. Uh, the next steps we um, have in mind is, um, as said, uh, men or as mentioned before, the second phase I've been talking about, and this is really to move from this three theory, from the conceptual study to practice, um, to um, yeah, to get these um, the generic components of workflows um, and um, allow others to reuse them and um, support them in um, yeah, under yeah, how. We need to understand how this could be applicable to other disciplines. So if you are interested in explore, exploring um, data publication workflows um, more, let us know, because we are really looking for um, implementation, for test beds, as we call them before, um, so um, where we could um, implement um, specific data peer reviews, for example, um, or um, identifier assignments, um, things like this um, in practical terms. So again, um, this is um, today a good opportunity to contact us or of course afterwards. So what we see, what we see as the role of publishers um, here is um, a, a crucial one um, because, and here I speak in rather private terms, um, our researchers in high energy physics, for example, they love um, um, open access, they have, we have a preprint culture, but um, they trust um, journals. Everyone submits um, to journals, um, even though we have an established preprint culture, and this is um, the main goal. So for data publishing, um, we consider it crucial as well um, to involve um, yeah, journal editors um, and um, the um, publishers. So um, your role is crucial, um, not only to let us know what's already out there, so we understand um, the extreme complexity of workflows to publish data, but also, um, as mentioned before, um, as test sets. So um, I'm concluding with saying, please let us know if you have an interest in um, understanding the complexity of workflows um, in a theoretical sense and um, in practical terms, which should happen or should start shortly. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sunye. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, it is clear to the audience uh, how useful this work can be and will be uh, for publishers who want to do more in uh, research data. Uh, we have uh, the possibility for two or three questions. Is there anyone in the audience would like to pose a question. I'm assuming that you can unmute your microphone, but if not, then please put in the chat window whether you have a question and I can turn on your microphone. In fact, FQ participants can raise their hands using the, the, the GoToWebinar interface. Okay. There's, there's an icon to raise uh, your hand. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, if anybody wants to raise their hand, I can unmute you. I think, Anita, this means you have a question. Let me see. Anita, are you there? No, I didn't have a question. Oh, because there's a question mark in front of your name. <laughs> and I'm, then I'm going to mute you again. <laughs> I'm going to be very rude, although your question is always good. But I see a question from Hans Pfeifenberger. Hans, very good you're here. Please. Your microphone is on. Yes, I heard a German announcement, not from you. Um, ah. Hi, Zin, hi Zin here. Um, <laughs> um, no. I think that uh, you, uh, in one of the last slides, which uh, you went over quite fast, uh, there were some questions uh, about uh, formats and so on. And I mm -hmm. think there might be, um, it might, might be difficult to answer these questions from a questionnaire because they are preformed or they looked rather preformed as if coming from a data repository say um, so um, I don't know if there will be a qualitative discussion on, on what is actually uh, where um, yes for um, example, you are absolutely right or ABC questions 
which more or less looked as if it were possible to have a peer review or as they may look as if the peer review on data and metadata may, 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 might be made by the same person. And I, I would doubt that. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> um, your question is very right because it points exactly to what I have not said. <laughs> and um, this means um, because we are actually preparing to do um, ind indeed qualitative interviews. Because um, we are planning to have a survey and interviews, um, survey to really understand what's out there, interviews to understand the details. Um, because it's exactly what you said, um, with a questionnaire I would not get these answers. And it's not only one person and which is usually involved in such a workflow, no, it's plenty of persons and even different institutions, so um, different working groups, etc. So um, the questionnaire, um, sorry, the interviews um, will be rather detailed and will allow us um, to dig deep uh, which also, I'm aware, um, means a lot of work. Um, that's why we are looking for uh, support. <laughs> and, um, yeah. But I think it's a um, step that needs to be done uh, to understand the complexity, because it's a complex environment. Okay, thank you, uh, Sunye. Um, Let's see if I see anybody else raise their hands. No? In that case, I have a very practical question for you. If any of the publishers who are on this webinar have very good examples of workflows for research data and publications, and they would like to share it with you, or if they would like to participate in the questionnaires or in the test beds, what is the best way to contact you? Africa, uh, there is a hand raised. An email. Ah, okay. So if you can do this question first. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, just drop me, uh, Jonathan and myself, an email or send an email to the um, working group. I presume, Ifke, we will share the slides afterwards? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And so I will make sure I, we will provide our emails in there. Um, yeah. Okay, good. I think that's the absolutely perfect approach. Okay. The slides will be on the... RDA website and on the STM website, and so will be the recordings of this webinar. And okay. I see a question by Jerry Grenier of IEEE. Jerry, good to see you here. Please go ahead. Jerry, are you there? I turned your microphone on, but maybe it doesn't work. Uh, it looks like Gary is not connected correctly with the audio, Efke. Okay. Well, Jerry, maybe you can type your question into the chat box and we'll see if we can uh, get to it uh, later on. Yeah, there's a questions I, uh, window where... I, I see... The questions window, yes. Yeah. I don't see any questions. Okay, so maybe we should proceed? Yes, we shall proceed. I think we can go on to the next... Um, sorry, Jerry, but if we get your question later, we'll still do it. And then now we'll go on to our next presenter, that is Hilke Kors of Elsevier, who will be talking about infrastructure to link research data and the publications. Hilke, I'm handing over to you on my presenter much. screen, except that I that you're not in the list. No, he's presenter already, Efke. Um, because, oh, okay, that makes it easy. Good, I Hilke, take it along. Right, Hello, everybody. Can you hear me well? Yes, I think we can. Wonderful. So my name is Hilke Koers. I am the head of content innovation at the Elsevier, where I work on the, the article of the future. And I also oversee our program to interlink articles and data. And that is basically the background uh, with which I became interested in the work of the Data Publication Interest Group and specifically the Data Publication Services Working Group. 
So first of all, um, let me tell you a little bit what the Data Publication Services Group is all about. I am trying to move to the next slide, but it's going a little bit slowly. Um, and I think a good point to start there is to explain what we mean here with a service, because a service can mean many different things to, uh, to different people. Um, and I've tried to sketch that in the, the diagram that hopefully now everybody can see. Um, basically, the observation where we are coming from is that currently quite a lot of workflows and processes and communication channels already exist between different players in the data publication landscape with publishers and data centers, data centers and providers of bibliographic information, just to give two examples. But these are mostly bilateral arrangements, really one-on-one -on -one arrangements between these, uh, these parties. Um, so what we're trying to, uh, to do is to, to, to map these processes, to make an inventory of that, and explore where, uh, where there is an opportunity where these processes may be right to be lifted to um, a service model type of infrastructure where essentially there is a central resource, a central hub that people can uh, can tap into. So moving away from the system of all these bilateral arrangements to something with more a sort of standardized, centralized service that uh, that everybody who is interested and can benefit from that and can contribute can uh, tap into. So the reason why we want to do that, um, at the end I think it's a matter of, um, of scalability. Of course, all these bilateral uh, bilateral arrangements, there's a limit to the scale that you can achieve in, 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 in that way, and there's just a lot of benefits from, uh, from a network effect there. Um, increase in, in interoperability between the different uh, systems at play. Uh, decrease in the inefficiencies um, that are yeah, really woven into the system as it is currently. And ultimately, of course, uh, it's not only about being more efficient, it's also about doing more. Um, if such a central resource exists, there's just much more you can do, create new tools and, and new functionalities to the benefit of researchers. So that is still very descriptive and a little bit uh, abstract. Um, and also these processes, as the way I've described it so far, can apply to many different places in the data publication workflow. It could apply to submission systems, it could apply to editorial and review processes, or also post-publication. So to make sure that we, um, you know, we also focus our efforts a little bit and that at the end of, the, of this 18-month period that we have set for ourselves, we have a concrete and tangible result. The initial focus and really the key focus of the working group will be on uh, a cross-referencing service for articles and data. So that really lives post-publication all the way at the end of the data publication workflow. And essentially, um, it is as simple as a service that can be queried. Um, given Article A, what relevant data sets exist and vice versa. Given uh, data set B, what articles exist that have some relationship uh, with that data and also between data sets. At the minimum, that is just identifying the fact that such a connection exists, that such a link exists. But of course, you can do a little bit more. You can also add metadata that describes the nature of that relationship. For example, is the data supplementary material to the article? Is it cited data? Is it related data? And so on and so forth. And ideally, you would also like to capture some of the metadata for the constituents for the article and, and, and the data sets in there. So why is this a good thing? Um, I took the value proposition from our case statement, which, uh, by the way, is just uh, uh, available on the RDA and also the, the XUWDS website. So if you're interested, you can learn a little bit more there. Um, for data repositories and journal publishers, such a, such a common interface will make it much more easier, much more easy to create connections between the data sets or the journal articles that you host. So it helps you to um, you know, really add value and provide additional services for your users that make it easy for them to find content that is relevant for them, be it articles or be it data. Um, for many other people who have an interest in, in tracking research output and research productivity, this service will have to help to uh, create the dots so that it's easier to get a more comprehensive and more complete overview of, uh, of, of the research that's been created. And ultimately for the people on the ground, the end users and the researchers, such an infrastructure will help to make data more visible, to give more impact, and make it better findable and more discoverable. Um, 
I'm zooming in now a little bit on a specific use case, the one that I am also most familiar with from my work at, uh, at Elsevier. Um, and that is about linking articles and data in such a way that people who read an article on a publication platform can find uh, relevant data and, and vice versa. Um, I think many people uh, will agree that, that this is a good thing. It increases the visibility and the discoverability of both articles and data. And it provides some essential context for data sets that, that, that make, uh, make sure that at least it limits the, the, the risk of, uh, uh, of incorrect uh, usage or misinterpretation. Um, and it helps to coordinate things to ensure really long-term availability of, uh, of all this good stuff. Um, this point of view that you know it's, it's a good thing it makes sense to interlink articles and data. Um, that's also something uh, that researchers support. Um, just a little figure here that comes out of a survey that was conducted by Parse Insight in 2010, where they found that 85% of the researchers that they uh, that they surveyed indeed agreed that yes, this would be very useful to have. Now, in a very minimal way, um, of course, it is already possible to at least link out from articles to data sets just by putting the URL in there, supposing that the data set uh, lives somewhere on a website. However, that's not quite the best way to do it um, because these links often break after a certain moment in time and it's really hard to, um, you know, to keep, to keep that, uh, that record intact. Um, the figure that I'm showing here illustrates that I took that from a paper by Pepe et al. Um, and the size of the bars here shows the, uh, the volume of the uh, of, of hard-coded data links that they found. And the numbers that you see in the gray are the percentages of broken links. So you see that in, in about a decade, half of those links break, which clearly isn't a good thing for the scholarly record. Um, one example uh, of how publishers and data centers can really collaborate to have a more robust workflow, and that's an example that I took, that I'm most familiar with from my own work, is uh, the, the linking uh, that we have set up as Elsevier together with Pangea. And here we really collaborate together to ensure um, a workflow that points researchers to the right places all the way in the beginning, um, so when they have the data and they have the article. And then after publication, we connect basically the data that lives in Pangea and the article that lives on Science Direct, um, so that if you land on the data set at Pangea, you can easily go to Science Direct and vice versa. And on Science Direct, we, we even added uh, a little viewer that shows the location, that so it shows a bit of the metadata for the data. So this is just one example. Of course, you can link also in, in other ways, but just to uh, you have to give an example of how such a, such a link can look like in practice and why that is a useful thing for uh, researchers. Um, so moving that again a little bit to the more abstract discussion, if you like, um, this is just a sketch because essentially it's all about connecting the dots. What we're trying to do with the, with the services work group. So here, some dots represent articles, other represent data. So the example that I just gave for the Pangea Elsevier linking, you can think of it as that one little note, that one little uh, arrow that is uh, that is uh, included here on this diagram, and that's just part of the puzzle, right? That's a link that Pangea happens to know about and that Elsevier happens to know about, but this information is still pretty much secluded from other systems. It very much lives in a silo. So basically, what we're trying to do in the in the work group is to set up a system that takes all of these existing links from existing places, and that can be from data centers or from publishers or from uh, providers of bibliographic information or from other parties, anybody that has these links, consolidate that, pull them together, bring them in a, in a, in a common format in a central location so that we yeah, can really add all that stuff together so that the sum is really of more value than all the individual components, and then also package that as a service. So it's about getting all the content together, getting all these links together in, in, a, in a harmonized way, in a normalized way, but also exposing that through a service which is both accessible for humans but also machine readable, of course. So coming back just a little bit about the, um, you know, the way that the working group is, uh, is set up, the deliverables that we have set for ourselves are primarily this, uh, this article data cross-referencing service. Um, a little bit of uh, desk study around that, if you like, with an inventory and a gap analysis and recommendations. But most importantly, we really want to have an operational cross-referencing service live at the end of this 18-month period. It will be a beta release with limited functionality and 
limited coverage still, but something that really demonstrates the value of this. And then we also want to come up with recommendations taking basically this article data linking service as a case in point, um, and then points to other processes that exist currently between all these players that potentially can also be lifted to this type of a service model. And of course here we really see a very close collaboration with uh, the workflow working group that Sunji has just been uh, uh, speaking about. And just very briefly the timeline. Um, we are a little behind schedule uh, in the beginning, but really starting uh, the actual segment participants, if anybody who has a question raises their hand, then I can unmute your microphone. Let's see. Nobody there yet. I have a very simple question to you, Hilke, if you allow me. Oh, here's a question. David Smith from the IET, the Institute of Electrical and Technical Engineers, if I'm right. David, go ahead. I've unmuted your mic. So, Aha, can you hear me? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Oh, hello, everybody. Um, are clear about is that it needs to be operated and managed by the stakeholder group. Quite analogous indeed to the, the Crossref model I think is actually very good. That is our current thinking. Exactly how that needs to take shape I still, uh, yeah, we, we still need to discuss that and work some out of the details. But a model um, yeah, where there is some form of, um, of governance board where all the stakeholders are represented, that is definitely what we have in mind. Okay, thank you very much. That was exactly my question, so thank you, uh, David. Um, let me see if there's any other hands raised. So far, not. Uh, which means that we can go on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is Sarah Callaghan of STFC. And uh, she leads the groups together with Kristen Leonard. Uh, of the uh, what is it environmental research data center in the US together they uh, lead the working group on bibliometrics of, of research data and I think I will now switch the screen to Sarah Sarah the screen should now be yours I haven't seen anything popping up to tell me that it is yes let me try it again. I'm trying to make you presenter, but you are in control now. Am I? Think. Can people see my um, title slide? Not yet. I saw it for a little while. Yes, I, I, I was presenter for a few moments and then um, it got taken back off me again. Back. Yes, I know that also. I'm trying to make your presenter now, but it doesn't work. Mustafa, can you do that? Okay, well, while we're waiting for um, the uh, technical issues to get sorted out, I just want to say thank you to Eska for the introduction. Um, as she mentioned, uh, my name is Sarah Callahan, and I work for the British Atmospheric Data Centre. Um, so I work for a data repository based in the UK as the name goes. But before I worked for um, the BADC, I worked for a small research group um, which was um, studying um, the effects of atmosphere, uh, the atmosphere on radio systems. And as part of that research group, I created um, several large and long-term data sets, uh, which have since been um, have published at the BADC and have also been formally published in the Geoscience Data Journal, which is a, a Wiley data journal. So I kind of have a, an interesting background in that um, I am a poacher turned gamekeeper, so to speak. 
Uh, I started off being a researcher, doing all the wrong data management things that all researchers do, and uh, have now uh, learned all the right things to do, but importantly, I know how to talk to researchers, because I was one. Um, I'm still trying to um, see if my slides are going to come up at any point. Yes, I'm trying to get it done, but it doesn't work. Mustafa, are you still there? Uh, yes, I am, and unfortunately, I'm I'm struggling with a slow internet connection, and I can't seem to unlock the screen for Sarah. Okay, well, I think what I'll probably do is I'll just start talking, and um, the slides aren't that um, interesting. We can catch up later. So, okay, I'll just start talking. So, um, I'm sure that everybody in the audience knows what bibliometrics are. Um, probably better than I do because I trained as a physicist, not as a librarian or anything or like that. Um, but just to be on the safe side, um, bibliometrics, they are quantitative measures to assess and measure impact um, and also to assess the quality of the research and the researchers that produce it. And they do this by tracking and recording access and citations of scientific publications, so journal articles, obviously. Um, bibliometrics are also used um, as a proxy for how good a researcher is. It in, they inform and influence um, whether or not an individual researcher gets promotion or tenure and how well they progress in their academic careers. Um, how widely cited a paper is is also um, important when it comes to um, getting that all-important next grant. Um, and also, bibliometric, how, how cited the paper is, is also important to the um, owners and operators of the academic journal that uh, actually published it. Um, so basically, bibliometrics is all about evaluating the attention that scientific publications get from the scientific community. And of course, bibliometrics aren't just for individual um, articles, like the ISI Science Citation Index. Um, but you also have the H-index, which uh, is a, at least nominally a way of determining, um, uh, well, putting a metric on how good a researcher is. And then, of course, the journals themselves have impact factors. Um, of course, all these things exist. We're looking at applying bibliometrics to data, and we don't necessarily want to have the situation where we have to redo everything from scratch and start inventing the wheel from the very beginning. We want to take advantage of stuff that's already been developed and um, figure out uh, what we can do, what works, what we can take advantage of, and uh, what pitfalls we need to avoid. So this working group, it's called bibliometrics, but what we're actually doing is applying bibliometrics for data. And we want to apply um, measures to data to determine how used it is, how useful it is, and also how much of an impact it has. And our reason for doing this is because data producers and researchers have an awful lot of, um, well, it takes an awful lot of time and effort to collect data sets from, or collect a data set as a result of, a, of an experiment in the first place. We're asking researchers to put yet more time and effort into making the data sets open and available and useful to other people. Um, a researcher can get, about, get by with doing a minimum amount of data processing and management so that they or their research group can understand it. If you want them to share it with other, their data with other people, it starts getting more complicated. Um, if we, and to do data publication, we want to be able to show the researcher that all that extra effort in data management and data publication is actually useful for them personally in terms of um, academic recognition and tenure and promotion and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so we need to have the bibliometrics, we need to have the proof that publishing data will work if we want to change the, uh, the culture, the scientific culture, so that data publication is the norm and that the people who are changed in scientific culture so that the people who produce data actually get the recognition they deserve for doing so. So um, the big uh, bibliometric measure that comes up when you start talking about data is data citation. Um, and unfortunately, it's not standard practice in the research community at the moment, although it is getting more common as more and more people and more and more journals are um, 
putting things into their guidance for authors to say that data citation should be happening. There's an off, also an awful lot of research funders who are putting down in writing in their data management or their data policies saying things like data should be cited, which is very helpful. There's um, been a lot of work done by various groups, um, including the Codata Task Group on Data Citation and the Joint um, Working Group on Data Citation that was a combination of the Codata Task Group plus various groups um, from Force 11 and around the place. And they re that resulted in the Joint Declaration on Data Citation Principles, which uh, we're in the process of uh, disseminating at the moment. And there is a Force 11 working group on um, how to implement the uh, joint uh, data citation principles. Uh, and they're just kicking off to um, come up with practical solutions at the moment. Um, data repositories, an awful lot of them are not ready for data publication concept, and they haven't implemented formal procedures, although um, that is changing as well, I'm very glad to say. When it comes to data and when it comes to data publication, we have plenty of um, naughty problems like granularity, versioning, unique identification, metadata, um, how we review data sets. They, these problems are there. We acknowledge that they're there. They're not going to go away anytime soon um, without some serious effort being put into them, but we can, we can manage that. We can work on that, and people are working on that. So the goals of the working group are to conceptualize data metrics and corresponding services to overcome the barriers. So we want to um, find out what's going on um, by talking to people and um, raising the whole concept of uh, bibliometrics for data. Um, and we want to evaluate and report on the possible models, how we can actually get bibliometrics for data in common usage. Um, and we want to look at the possible barriers for the implementation and adoption of data citation as well. Um, this next slide that I'm looking at is a list of our members, which um, we are always on the lookout for new members, uh, especially people with an interest in uh, bibliometrics in general or things like altmetrics. We're predominantly a US-EU membership, so if people are um, interested and also from outside the US or the EU, that would be fantastic too. Um, okay. Uh, we have produced our case statement, um, which is available on the um, RDA website. It outlines the rationale, requirements, benefits and challenges. Um, and it also presents our work plan and our plan for adoption. Uh, it also gives a list of the um, initi existing initiatives and efforts um, that already exist that we're um, planning on interacting with. Um, in our work plan, the main thing that we're working on is we are producing a survey um, talking to the various stakeholders like researchers, like repositories, um, like um, journal managers, uh, like journal editors and um, reviewers uh, to evaluate the possible approaches that we could take. What sort of things do researchers and do our stakeholders actually want? Um, data metrics to actually achieve. Um, and we have uh, kind of broken down the tasks for our survey. Um, we're figuring out who is the audience, what do we want to ask our audience, um, and then develop the questions uh, for um, our user requirements. Um, as, as I said, I trained as a physicist. I'm not a social scientist, so um, if there's anyone out there who feels like joining us who has a background in kind of formulating surveys, we would be very grateful to hear from you. The survey results will um, feed into our next lot of deliverables, which are our recommendations on best practice. And we're also going to be, as well as the survey and talking to people, we'll also be doing desk-based research, looking at the literature, seeing what's out there. Um, in order order to kind of come up with the best possible recommendations for best practice that we possibly can. Um, yeah, so we're looking at questions like what are the building blocks for an optimal system? Um, what changes need to be made, societally speaking, from funders and policymakers and data centers, learned societies, yourselves, scientific publishers, um, academic institutions? What, what changes need to be made by these stakeholders in order to implement data citation and metrics? Um, there's a question, do we need commonly operated services or can we 
use different services depending on what um, scientific domain we're in. Um, what technical components do we need? What's available? What do we have to create? Um, how community specific do we need to produce these recommendations? Um, and of course, what are the costs for data metrics? Because everything comes with a cost, more is the pity. So um, in our case statement, we have our adoption plan, which is uh, talking about our recommendations for all our stakeholders. That, and we will, in those recommendations, we will include case studies um, giving concrete examples of bibliometrics and uh, um, and how they have benefited the various stakeholders, because I think that's quite important to be able to tell this to people. Um, we also want to have as wide an engagement with um, the community as we possibly can. Um, as I said, our deliverables, we have case studies. Um, we also will have general requirements. And um, for general requirements for the citability of scientific data, and we will be, um, as I said, not reinventing the wheel. We'll be relying on the work, excellent work done by the Force 11 group and the Codata Task Group. Um, we'll also have uh, use cases and requirements to provide guidance on concrete, practical next steps. And of course, we are not doing this in isolation. Hooker already mentioned, um, also in one of his slides, we will be. Um, working in collaboration with the Publishing Services Working Group and um, the other working groups in the Publishing Data Interest Group to um, ensure that we uh, collaborate properly and um, can help each other out, basically. Um, I've got a time plan in front of me. That's not really much help seeing as my slides aren't being broadcast, but you'll be able to see them on the website when the slides are published. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up there by saying um, if you have any interest in this, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you have any feedback from us, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and if you are um, interested in joining us, we'd definitely love to hear from you. Um, tell us what you think. Please join us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. And apologies that we couldn't show your slides. I know they were really good. So uh, they'll be on our website so people can come for it uh, later on. I'm uh, also looking at the list of attendees. People can raise their hand if they want to pose a question. I don't see anybody yet. There were a few questions in the question box. Uh, one is an offer to help you design the surveys. Uh, oh, yes, please. Sure. <laughs> and some good names with it, too. That was posted by Anita. And a question by David Carlson from ESSD. We have very little concerns about data citation. Uh, David, do you want to pose your question like this, maybe? I can turn on your microphone. It's turned on now, if you like. Uh, then Anita has a question to unmute her. Anita, you're now unmuted. Please go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to say, Sarah, for the um, uh, the cost recovery working group, um, we spoke with uh, George Alter, who heads up ICPSR. So that's these people make questionnaires for a living. They're social scientists, and there's lots of ideas about um, questionnaire design that they have. And he offered help from a person from this group. And similarly, Micah Altman, he is um, at uh, MIT. He's uh, an economist originally. Yes, and I know Micah well. Yeah. Yeah, so he has great ideas about survey design as well. So um, I don't know if you know both of them. Uh, you're welcome to just write to them, I'm sure. Uh, or, or if you want, I can I can forward an email if you have a description of the types of questions you want to ask. Um, I, I know Michael well. Um, what was the other person? George Alter. A-L-T-E-R. A-L-P-R. T-E-R. It's in the question box if you can see that. Uh, I can't. I can only see the questions from the panel. Or they only mm. see the chat box from the panel. That's interesting. All right. Well, um, George Alter, A L T E R at I C P S R. Um, yeah, we know you can George. start there, or um, there's somebody in this group who we, um, who we uh, said might work with us, but but it would be good to start uh, probably with George. That would be gr that's great. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you, uh, Anita. 
Um, I have one last question for you, Sarah, before we move to our next speaker. I know you're also uh, involved in Force 11 and the Data Citation Joint Group. Uh, we have so many publishers here in this webinar. If you could give them uh, three simple things that would improve data citation, what would the three things be? Ooh, okay. Um, so, I would say um, thing number one would be update guidance for authors of all um, of all the journals, saying that um, when um, uh, data should be cited and giving guidance on how they actually should cite it. Um, so telling them it should be in the form of um, author, data set, title, publisher, whatever. Um, probably the best bet is using the data site schema and recommendations. They're, they're very good and are rapidly becoming the standard. Um, number two is I would suggest um, letting your editors know that um, data citation is now a thing and getting them to encourage um, authors um, to actually cite the data properly. Um, and also get, getting them to um, encourage the uh, paper reviewers uh, that when they do a review, to, if there is a data set mentioned in the paper, to um, actually make sure that it is cited in, in an appropriate sort of way. Um, so ask guidance for authors, um, encourage the editors um, to do data citation promotion. Um, I, um, and through the editors do um, the reviewers. Um, three, uh, sign up for the um, Joint Declaration on Data Citation Principles. The, there's a website. Um, it is force11.org, I think, and it's forward slash data citation. OK. Well, we as STM endorsed it, so that's already one step. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Again, your slides will be on the website. Sorry we couldn't show them now. We might have difficulties with the next slides as well. And the reason is we lost Mustafa in the process. His computer got stuck. And since he was the last presenter, technically, he should hand over to the next one. But he can't do that. Uh, I'll make one more attempt. Yes, Ingrid, I can actually make you presenter says my screen which I've done now that means that we're going to our last speaker of today and she's Ingrid Dillo of the Dutch Data Research Data Center in the Netherlands uh, and she leads together with Simon Hodson of uh, uh, the CoData ICSU organization the two of them lead the working group on cost modeling and cost recovery. Ingrid, you are now the presenter, so you should be able, if you click the button show my screen, to show your slides. And I think I see something coming up already. Yes, working group on cost recovery. Ingrid, the floor is yours, but your f microphone is muted, I see. And I cannot unmute you because it's self-muted. Ah, you're now unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Wow, that's and we can see your slides, yes. <coughs> so maybe at the end of the webinar it all starts to work. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Well, like Eiske already said, I work at DANS, and DANS is a national data repository in the Netherlands. And I experience in practice um, the ever-growing task of data repositories to take care of the long-term sustainability of data and also of the pressure on the structural funding. At DANS we are developing alternative revenue streams, for example by charging institutions um, for depositing data. So the topic of this working group, cost recovery for data repositories, is very close to my heart. Um, and I would like to start, and now I have to see how I switch to the next slide. Yeah, and maybe you can put it on full screen mode. Oh, let me see. And then you can just go 
forwards and backwards as you do with okay. yes, that's it. Yes. And then, yes. yes. Okay, great. We see the cover slide now. Okay. Well, you should see the next one. Do you well, see it the sometimes one? takes a while before it. Uh, okay. Well, I'll just start. The system is a bit slow. Yeah. Just talk and keep in mind that some people see it later. Yeah. So, like I said, I would like to start by sketching the background of this fourth and final working group on cost recovery. Um, our working group will pay attention to the financial aspects of data publishing and also of permanent data availability. And what we are seeing is an ever-growing, and you all know that, an ever-growing data flood. And this data flood is also combined with the fact that data are becoming more and more complex and that they are becoming more and more intertwined with both publications and software. So the task of taking care of these data is becoming bigger and bigger. And next to that, we are also living in a time of tightening budgets, so we need to address the challenge of ensuring the sustainability of data and care of the long-term preservation and also the long-term availability of these data. Now, all of this um, causes a real concern that the basic funding of data centers may not keep pace in the coming years with the increasing costs. So we need to consider alternative cost recovery options and a diversification of revenue streams. So the central question really is, who will pay for public access to research data? Um, as you heard, all four working groups look at different aspects of data publishing as an incentive for researchers, of course, to open up their data, but also as a means um, to integrate data more effectively with the process of scholarly communication. And in our working group, the focus will be on the involvement of data centers in data publishing activities, and we want to examine such initiatives also as a potential source of alternative revenue. Now, if you look at the different cost components that are attached to data publishing, we roughly see three elements, and I have put them on the slide here. Um, first of all, um, let me see how I can change this a bit. Um, we have the element of ensuring a publishable data project product. So this involves the annotation of the data, um, uh, collecting of uh, composing metadata, maybe even um, setting up code boots, etc. So all of these elements are largely on the plate of the researcher himself. Another cost component concerns um, the quality assurance and the review process of uh, data publications. In some cases, um, the publisher plays a role, but also very often the data repository plays a role, um, especially when it comes to um, the more technical review elements. A final element, of course, is the long-term preservation, um, the archiving and um, permanent access services. And also these are largely the responsibility of the data repository. Um, so, what do we want to contribute with the work of our group? A lot of work is already going on in many proje uh, projects to understand the costs of maintaining long-term accessibility to uh, digital information and to identify the different cost components that are involved in um, permanent um, in the preservation. And also, on the basis of this, um, work is being done on developing more general cost models. Now, the focus of our group will be slightly different. We want to look at the possibilities of cost recovery for data centers, as they are the important stakeholders when it comes to data publishing. So what we want to do is we want to do research to understand the current and possible cost recovery strategies. And within that, we want to pay particular attention to uh, the involvement of data repositories in data publishing activities and also to examine such initiatives as a potential source of alternative revenue, like I said. Um, in order, um, no, uh, first of all, the deliveries. What do we aim to deliver as products of our group? 
First of all, um, we envisage to produce a report with conclusions and recommendations about the potential appropriateness of um, different cost recovery models to different situations and also look at the potential of data publication initiatives fitting into such a cost recovery strategy. This is one element. The other element is that we want to contribute our findings to the combined uh, testing of the various models and scenarios that come out of the other working groups as well. So um, attach cost components, for example, to the steps in data publishing workflows. Now, in order to achieve um, all uh, of these deliverables, we have identified five areas um, of work to produce this. Um, and I have them here on a slide. I don't know whether you can see them, but the first um, step will be um, to um, come up with, you could say, a kind of summary of the work that is being done on cost models already. And there we want to build firmly on um, the work that is now uh, being done within the uh, European 4C project on um, generic cost models. A second strand is that we want to look at the policies of research funders, um, specifically um, to the question how the costs of data availability and data publication may be recovered. And there we want to build on work that is now being done um, within um, the Knowledge Exchange Group in Europe and also within Science Europe, um, the combined um, research funders within Europe that are also um, dealing with uh, these kinds of issues. Now, the core uh, activity of our group will again be a survey, a survey which consists of two um, strands. First of all, a web-based questionnaire, but secondly, also in-depth case studies. Um, and this survey will look at the various existing, already existing approaches to cost recovery and to uh, innovative business models. And our aim is there to approach um, a large group of data repositories, for example, members of the World Data System, um, holders of the Data Seal of Approval, the members of um, the American ICPSR, and other established data centers. Then, um, to um, add to these views, we also would like to know the views of other stakeholders, like the publishers and also the researchers themselves, to understand their position and policy when it comes to charging models and their role in the publishing process. And like I said before, we will finally build on the outcomes of um, mostly, I think, the working group on workflows. And we will try to identify the resource and cost implications that are associated with the workflow models that they will use. Um, on this slide, that I hope you can see. Um, I have an overview of the membership of this group. Um, as you can see, it's a diverse uh, company um, of people coming from different sta uh, stakeholder groups. And we also have one representative uh, from the publishers in our group, in the person of Anita de Waard from Elsevier, who is doing excellent work. And I think it's obvious that you as publishers uh, form a key stakeholder group in the area of data publishing. And I imagine that you also have an interest in the financial sustainability of long-term data archives. The data publishing um, activities of publishers and also um, the data availability policies um, that a growing number of publishers is um, uh, composing can only thrive if they can rely on the long-term availability of these data. And that is precisely the core business of trusted data archives. So we are now, at the moment, in the phase of uh, starting up our work. So anyone who would like to participate in this effort is, of course, more than welcome to join us. And we would also um, like to um, ask anyone who can point us to already existing innovative examples of recovery models that are around, to please let us know. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ingrid. And sorry, uh, your slides seem not to move forward. I don't know why. But oh, okay. again, uh, they'll be available on the, um, on the website, so people will be able uh, to see them. We have time for one or two questions. I'm looking at the list of attendees. Anybody who wants to um, raise a question 
can raise their hand and then I can unmute your microphone. I don't see anybody yet. Okay. Ah, David, David Smith. Yes. Uh, you've yes. I've unmuted your microphone, David, but you've self-muted it. Yes, you're now able to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Oh, sorry, me again. Um, so I guess this is a really uh, general question, um, and my question is really. Um, how do we uh, descri describe the guts of the data in question, whatever myriad different forms it might take? How do we um, come up with appropriate descriptions for this stuff and make it all connect together in some uh, useful manner. I suppose uh, for me, I realize it's an extremely broad question, but I, I guess I keep retreating back to, to something of um, uh, my, my working life in that kind of, you know, indexing and semantics and all of that kind of thing um, here. But I'm trying to see how these things uh, stick together. How do you take a piece of quite raw information from a, 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 an experiment and apply something useful to it to allow it to be um, discovered and otherwise uh, utilized. May I respond to that one? If can. I'm fine with it. Uh, the question was maybe for Ingrid. Ingrid, are you okay if uh, Michael chips in? Yes, yeah, I do. Okay, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I think I think uh, uh, Dave didn't have in mind uh, the cost aspect, but more uh, the interoperability. So. Uh, that that was the part that I was stressing in the um, in the opening. So we need to make sure that uh, that data can be integrated, that are, that they are harmonized uh, and accessible. And for that, we have in the various communities worldwide, we have um, various standards. You know this joke, you know about standards and uh, proliferation of standards. Uh, but uh, this is reality, and uh, we can be happy that at least within certain communities there are certain standards, and um, that we can connect uh, the bits and the pieces uh, somehow. Uh, but I think um, the topics that we have raised here, like citability and uh, cross-referencing on a very broad base, first articles and uh, science data, and uh, ensuring that the workflows are in a way that um, the data that are archived and published uh, have a certain quality are the first necessary steps to be taken. And uh, interoperability is uh, something that we have on the screen, but uh, so far, seeing the landscape, um, we cannot expect this to happen within the next five years. So everybody is dreaming of a big cloud where we all put our science data into and having reasonable application and everybody uh, profiting from that. But I think that is, uh, we're far away from that. Okay. Thank you. But there are, of course, a few steps we can take in the meantime to make the future happen a bit faster. Sure. Uh, David, does this uh, address your question? I, I guess partly. I, I guess it's. Uh, I, I realize it was an extremely um, broad question. Um, it, it seems to me a bit of a circular thing. I understand all the points about the workflow and all the rest of it, but, but at the end of the day, for this stuff to take off, um, there has to be obvious utility uh, in the end results um, for people to see uh, the reasons why they should put their time and effort into doing it. And I suppose that matters whether you're a publisher wondering what's in it for us or whether you're a researcher wondering why it is you want to do whatever the next next, next step of uh, uh, requirements is on, on top of the work that you're all doing. 
Um, so yeah, I didn't I didn't expect a particularly neat answer to it necessarily, but um, um, if anybody wants to touch base with me offline about that one, I'm interested in exploring that area further. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a very good point. Uh, and why are we also yes? Can I say a quick yes, word? Yes, you can. Please um, go ahead. Sorry, because I think that's a particularly important question for the workflows group, because I do think that there is um, quite a extreme utility um, for publishers in there. I mean, we, of course, as I said, we have to put lots of them effort beforehand, but um, it, we try to build components on a conceptual or also on a technical layer that could be reused. Um, so I see our function also a bit of um, not only you know, providing the basics, but also um, as a bit of a switchboard of lessons learned and um, best practices and etc. Um, so I think um, that might be of interest to discuss a bit further, so that I would have an interest to take this offline, this discussion. Okay, very good. Um, one last question. It's half past five, at least in my time zone. Uh, let's see, who would like to take the floor? Ah, Hans, Hans Pfeifenberger, you have a concrete example on the last question, I'm immediately going to unmute your microphone for that. But it's also self-muted, so if you have to unmute it yourself as well. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ivke. <coughs> I understood the previous question as a question whether it is doable or what good it could do. And I think there are some examples uh, of uh, how the interlinking between uh, publications and data and, and whatnot can help um, uncover the, the, the relation, uh, make some use or make some, uh, some good uh, usage uh, more easy. And I would point to our portal which is called uh, expedition.awi.de uh, and when you go, search, go searching for data there and I could send you an, 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 a screen snapshot. You can see how relationships between data and publications are displayed in, in many ways. So I hope that we actually help people there, discovering data or discovering their connections. Um, it is possible and it has only been possible because um, before we constructed that, uh, that portal, we had a Pangea with uh, 300,000 data sets and we had a publication repository with uh, 30,000 uh, objects in it. And so now we have lots of relationships and um, I, I think as soon as um, each the data and the publications are individually marked up that there is something at the other end, namely via DOI, which might be related to this one, to the current object, uh, things will begin popping up. Okay, thank you. That is a, a positive and encouraging note, um, a positive note also to uh, conclude this webinar. I would like to um, thank all people who participated uh, for your uh, attention, but also for your patience with some of the technical glitches that we had. I'm sorry that we couldn't show you all the slides or that some of the slides that we did show you uh, uh, went too slow, but I hope you still found the stories that you heard interesting. We'll have all the slides and the recordings on the FTM website as well as on the RDA website. And uh, so you can always uh, look at it there again. And if you have further questions or would like to engage in deeper discussions about certain topics, or even better, if you would like to participate in any of these working groups, please let us know. And for now, I really would like to thank you for uh, being here. And also with a big thank you for all the five presenters that we had. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>